good morning friends welcome to this buzzword webinar very specially on the future of the buses in india and the kind of requirements that we have as a matter of fact in the next say 10 years as you know that the growth of bus system in india is really not proportionate to the growth in transport demand the demand supply gap has led to operations of overcrowded uncomfortable and unsafe buses reducing their attractiveness to public and resulting in a shift towards personal vehicles the share of buses including public buses in the total vehicle population is only about 0.8% with the increase in population there will be increase in associated travel demand by 2030 urban sector population urban population is going to be almost like 600 million unless intervened there will be continued growth in the use of private vehicles to meet the transport demand this will certainly result in increased negative impacts affecting environment human health and economy therefore there is an urgent need to plan the growth of transport sector on a sustainable path to minimize the impact today's seminar is really focusing on the future requirements of buses in india and what is the kind of deficit that we have we have four very distinguished speakers uh, who as a matter of fact would like to uh, touch upon all these issues and uh, uh, among them we have the first speaker who is mr satender kumar program manager mobility practice frost and uh, uh, sulevan frost and sulevan actually is a research and consulting firm that helps clients accelerate growth 98% of the top 1000 companies partner with frost and sulevan mr satender kumar is an automobile engineer and holds a masters degree in finance his functional expertise is in uh, business research and strategy he specializes in competitive intelligence and benchmarking new market entry and diversification strategy and end consumer analysis emerging technology and customer purchasing behavior is another ex, you know expertise his industry expertise includes broad range of sectors leveraging long standing working relationship with leading industry participants senior executives i like to invite uh, mr satender kumar for his uh, brief presentation please thank you uh, thank you dr kulban thank you so much for this warm introduction uh, first of all let me uh, welcome everybody on board for uh, today's presentation a very important and pertinent topic has been cho chosen for today's discussion that is future of bus based public transport system the current deficits and future requirements now uh, 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 starting from where mr singh had just spoken about uh, uh, let me try to set the context now we understand that we have already seen a declining trend when we talk about bus ridership and the primary reasons that i can think of why there has been a declining trend in the bus ridership is uh, three prong one uh, the image of uh, image among the public when we talk about bus transportation is that of an overcrowded bus with lack of any safety or any any comfort uh, measures that is uh, employed there and on top of that even uh, a lot of inefficiency when we talk about the terminals when we talk about uh, the boarding and holding points uh, there is so much of gaps that is uh, still uh, prevalent in the industry and perhaps that is one reason that lot of customers or urban commuters look to prefer uh, other alternate modes of transportation be it personal cars or be it two wheelers or three wheelers rather than opting for bus based transportation system now going forward there is a rapid need to examine the possibilities if we want to strengthen the bus based public transport issues and fill the existing gaps now if i try to uh, paint a picture of india's economy like mr uh, singh just said that you know uh, by 2030 we are anticipating that the urban population will be around 600 million so that is a huge amount and when we talk about 2030 
from an existing 65% contribution towards India's GDP, uh, the contribution towards India's GDP will become 70%. So with that, that kind of growth in urbanization, with that kind of growth in the contribution towards GDP, we are also looking at huge pressure on the public transportation system. And until and unless we have got a ready-made plan which is ready to get, get deployed and scale up when, we, when the need is coming, uh, we should be a little we should be a little aware about that as well and that is why the government of india has also earmarked uh, a corpus of 74 billion dollars uh, from 2011 to 2031 in order to uh, uh, deploy mass transit systems so let us understand why there is a requirement to deploy mass transit systems uh, there are three or four important stats that we have tried to understand here one the road transport sector alone contributes 8% to the GDP. And out of that, 85% is the contribution by the bus segment alone. Second, if we talk about the economic loss when we talk about traffic congestion, so uh, like I said, uh, that there is already, uh, I mean, less than 8%, less than 0.8 percentage of uh, buses are, uh, uh, of the registered vehicles flying on the Indian roads are buses. Rest all are either uh, private uh, uh, transport vehicles or cars and so on and so forth. So the traffic congestion in, Top four metro cities alone accounts for 25 to 26 billion dollars. And third important aspect, 20% of urban commuters are dependent totally on public transportation when we talk about uh, important places like Delhi and Mumbai. So all these reasons definitely tell us a point in time that, you know, uh, there has to be a lot of emphasis on bus-based transportation system because that is how the urban commuters are going to move when we talk about passenger mobility. Now, uh, India has got its own flavor, its own dynamic. And when we have to think or discuss about passenger mobility moving forward till 2025, we have to also understand some of the mega trends that is going to impact the industry. Now, one very important aspect that we have been seeing in the last few years uh, is the talk about environmental factor. There's a lot of pressure, not only from the Indian government, but also from international organization in order to reduce the carbon footprint on the globe. And that is where perhaps a more sustainable, a more greener mode of transportation would be required for urban commuting. Secondly, when we talk about urbanization, when we talk about uh, concepts like super cities, mega regions and smart cities, uh, there has to be a mass transit initiatives just like what we have already done in past uh, in the last decade for BRT systems. Although it has not been much of a success in a lot of cities, but we have to definitely evaluate and explore that what could be the challenges that can be definitely dealt in short term and it could be replicated what other uh, uh, other countries in late time region have already done. Fourth and most important aspect is uh, public safety and convenience. Now, Currently, we are in a point. We are in a time zone when you know most of the customers, either be it a Flipkart user or or a, a Ola or a, a Uber user, they are looking for value for money for everything that they are spending. Now, when we talk about uh, today's public transportation, when we talk about today's buses, uh, the image that has been created about an overcrowded bus without any safety or without any kind of uh, comfort or convenience that image has first of all need to be discarded and only then we can move forward we have to talk more about safety features we have to talk more about uh, advanced driver assistance systems because in india itself if we talk about the number of accidents per year it is to the tune of 1.5 uh, lakhs per year and when we talk about the bus sector alone uh, the, the, that that number alone is around 15 to 20 thousand lives that is lost per year uh, by road accident by bus and lastly electric and autonomous vehicles these are some of the techni technical, uh, technological advancements that we perceive, that we anticipate that might happen in near future. Of course, we have already seen a lot of activity in the uh, uh, electric vehicle segment uh, with a lot of foreign entrants like BYD and Photon. They have already started flying uh, uh, roads on the Indian vehicles. And autonomous vehicle might be something of distant future, but definitely uh, if you take cues from uh, the global counterparts in North America and Europe, there are a lot of good case studies to showcase as well. Now, when we talk about the bus-based uh, transportation system, let us also quickly have a look at the traditional bus transport and the evolution of public uh, bus transit systems. Now, India is largely dependent on the traditional bus transport, and perhaps that is the reason why there is so much of inefficiency, not only in terms of operation, but also in terms of financial sustenance. Then we had moved on to BRT systems, the, uh, the bus rapid systems, which was not much of a success for the key cities, barring few cities like Hubli Dharwad or Indore or Ahmedabad, the other cities had, uh, had, had had a lot of challenges and they're still grappling with those issues. 
And moving forward, where we see where Frost and Sullivan as a as a consulting or a research firm, where we see is the huge potential is demand response to transit. And we have already seen a lot of global players and in India players like Shuttle who have done very well in the past few years. And that is that has definitely got a lot of potential. And of course, the most important aspect: how are we going to advance our current system? How are we going to advance our current operation model? That is ha that has to happen through uh, autonomous vehicles as well as alternate power frames, which is electric vehicle. And if we take cues, like I said, uh, from some of the global startups, uh, which was uh, funded by OEMs like Proterra, Navia, uh, Chariot by Ford, though it has gone bust now. But there are a lot of healthy case studies who have already developed prototypes, and there are vehicles which is running on the roads of California and Arizona, and has got good things to say about uh, carbon footprint or fuel saving and uh, total cost of ownership. Now, uh, like I said, uh, moving ahead, DRT would be the uh, the next best important thing for uh, transportation, bus-based transportation. And when we talk about some of the important players on the global front, like Arriva or BBG in Berlin, they have already adapted and launched the DRT operations independently. In the cities where they are applying, those cities are also pursuing alternative and sustainable mobility modes. So, uh, uh, talking about the potential for DRT system from a current uh, current revenue potential of one billion, we are anticipating that this revenue potential might reach to 190 billion by 2030, and that because of a 120 times jump in the fleet size from 30,000 units today to around 3.8 million by uh, 2030. So that is that shows that the huge potential that the global front has, and India has to have a very important role when we talk about the growth of DRT systems, the growth of this particular market on a global scale. Now, uh, from a global perspective, let us try to dig a little deeper in, uh, uh, in the Indian context. Now, in this particular slide, we try to uh, play with some numbers from a, from a global perspective, try to uh, paint a picture of some of the important cities across the globe. And we have also mapped the key Indian cities, Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, Chennai, and Kolkata. And we have tried to split the different modes of transportation where we see bus is almost contributing around 14 to 25% of share of the total trips that is done in a day. Now, just to give a quick idea, uh, if you talk about 88 million trips that are conducted per day by the public uh, public modes of transportation, bus alone caters to 70 million trips that is done per day. And when we talk about the growth, if we talk about the compounded annual, the CAGR of, uh, of the bus segment, if we talk about the last 10 years, the growth in the bus segment has only been 2 to 3% in stark reality. In a stark comparison, when we talk about passenger or two or three wheelers, uh, the growth in that segment has been around 10 to 11 percent. So that clearly gives us a uh, gives us an idea that in spite of uh, 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 the public transportation loyalists in India, uh, there is still more emphasis on uh, you know uh, two wheelers and three wheelers and four wheelers rather than on bus transportation system. So uh, let us also try to understand what could have been a probable reason that you know there is a decl declining trend in the bus ridership. Uh, one, definitely there is an image issue. Uh, secondly, if we look at the picture of uh, last 10 years of data, last seven years of data from 2010 to 2017, what we have understood is some of the important, most important cities of India, they have not only been stagnant to a certain extent when we talk about the number of bus ridership, but also for key regions like Mumbai and Chennai, we have seen a declining trend to a tune of uh, negative 6% or negative 1.4% for Chennai. Now, when we talk about the growth in road passenger traffic, which is estimated to be around 15.4%, uh, the bus fleet is only growing at a rate of 3 to 4%. And, and one uh, primary reason that we can understand is also that the buses per thousand population in India is only around 1.2 uh, per thousand. Uh, if we further split it down to some of the important cities in India, like uh, uh, Chandigarh or Himachal, uh, that ratio again comes down to 0.5. And further economically uh, backward states like Bihar, UP or uh, Odisha, that ratio again comes down to 0.1 or 0.2 uh, buses per thousand population. Now, in order to understand what are the current deficit in the system, why there is such a behavioral change uh, 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 causing the declining trend in the ridership of buses, one, definitely inefficiency. So when I say inefficiency, it is not only uh, the operational inefficiency, but also uh, the financial sustainability, the financial inefficiency. So as for my understanding, except for BMTC in Karnataka, none of the other state transport undertakings uh, are doing very well. So although these are uh, state funded uh, organizations, but they are not able to survive in the current generation of market. So they definitely need to think about how that can be revived and how that can be uh, a change in time to come. Secondly, there's a lot of pressure also from uh, competitors like uh, uh, cab-based aggregators like Ola and Uber. 
So until and unless we start the public, way, the bus-based transportation system starts giving value for money in terms of technological advancements, in terms of comfort, safety, uh, definitely a lot of market share will be eaten away by these uh, cab-based aggregators or other alternate modes of transportation. Uh, thirdly, last mile connectivity, again, that is one of the top of the mind issue among urban commuters when we talk about uh, uh, last mile connectivity because uh, the current generation of buses, they definitely fly from point A to point B and leave out uh, some of the feeder regions uh, which, which caters to the uh, uh, last mile connectivity. And fourthly, technological advancements. So electric and autonomous is the way to go forward. Electric definitely will have ha happen at, uh, in India and at a shorter uh, time interval. But autonomous might be a distant future. But until and unless we start showcasing those case studies in India, uh, it will be difficult for a bus-based transportation system to really pick up. And in my conclusion, just to talk about and, and leave the forum open for discussion for other panelists uh, trying to talk about the requirements if you want to revolutionize the uh, bus-based transportation system, there are five important points that comes to my mind. One is OEM-based partnerships. So unlike other countries in India also, we need to start seeing partnership between the STUs and CTUs, uh, partner with the uh, 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 likes of you know, OEMs like Tata, Ashok Leland, or the foreign entrants in India. Uh, ride hailing developments, we have to take cues from the global counterparts, the uh, mobility as a service units, and try to understand their business model, explore the gaps, explore the demand uh, requirements, peak and off uh, peak uh, requirements of the urban commuters, and th then try to think in that direction and try to uh, uh, re re revolutionize the way we are uh, uh, running the model right now. Uh, public transit partnerships, we are already looking at a number of public transit authorities who are piloting demand responsive shuttles. So that is a work in progress. Uh, when we talk about investments, again, large and medium sized Indian cities are investing in extensive network of rapid transit. And finally, new vehicle segments. Uh, it is a slow process, a slow burner, but we are already so seeing a lot of progress in that direction uh, in terms of electric buses and uh, 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 you know, alternate powertrain buses. So with that, I come to the conclusion for uh, my presentation. Um, over to you, uh, uh, Dr. Singh. Say here. Because as a matter of fact, if there is a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of big section working from home, will it really impact the transport demand itself? I'm sorry, what was the question? I am saying that because of the pandemic and the future, uh, you know, uh, focus on work from home for many of the, you know, companies, and also in many of the major cities, how is it going to impact the demand? How do you foresee that? Absolutely, you're right. So if you're talking about the current pandemic situation and going forward, uh, we estimate that there's a requirement of at least 200 to 300,000 buses more if we, can, if we want to pursue the social distancing norms. And like you rightly said, uh, uh, the, the work from home policy that has been employed by most of the tech and uh, com uh, tech and other companies for uh, uh, in India, if we take a look at uh, what has already happened in other regions like China, they have already started uh, their day-to-day -day business. So if I, if I take the cues from China, the passenger mobility has reduced to 70% and the bus mobility has, has come to, or the bus ridership has come down to 25%. So we have to be prepared for that kind of scenario because already a lot of STUs and the private uh, uh, bus fleet operators are under a lot of financial duress because of the current situation. Going forward, we have to start thinking in a new direction. We have to perhaps uh, request the government for reduction of uh, you know, some of the taxes, uh, increase in the moratorium of payment of EMIs or look for uh, later renewal of uh, policy certificate of fitness certificates, look for smarter ways of interacting with the urban commuters by way of online ticketing, so on and so forth. So there has to be new way of looking at things with the current pandemic situation. Thank you so much. I think I'd like to move on. Uh, we do have another very distinguished speaker from Government of India, Mr. Gunchi Jayarao. He is the Joint Director, Project Monitoring Unit in the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways. He brings with him more than three decades of experience of working in a state road transport undertaking, Andhra Pradesh uh, State Road Transport Corporation. Mr. Jayarao is a mechanical engineer, 
He specializes in operational management, maintenance management, IT solutions, leadership training, and development. He has several professional achievements to his credit, including conceiving and developing the IT platform and comprehensive MIS for the corporation. He initiated and implemented ITS with offline and online ticket issuing machines. I'd like to invite Mr. Jaira Gunchi for his uh, brief presentation. Yeah, good morning, Singh Sab. Am I audible, sir? You are very much audible. Please continue. I, I request Sonam to share the, because some technical problem, I'm not able to share my presentation from here. Yeah. I request Sonam to just to present my PPT. Yeah, good morning. So thanks for the very good introduction by Singh Saab. And my panelist has given a very insightful and very detailed account of the public transport in India and across the nation also. My presentation is briefly touch upon the basics of the public transport in India, the existing gaps and the way forward because Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, sensing the urgency and need, has entrusted the reimbursable advisory services to World Bank and Transport for London. We have been working for the last 14 months. So I am going to present some of the learnings of this trip, Indian and international perspective. Next, please. Next slide, ma'am. So uh, this is the uh, preliminary uh, uh, slide only. So 87% uh, uh, road transport accounts for uh, passenger transport. It indicates the importance of the public transport. So in India, we are good in long distance uh, transportation. And to some extent, uh, the rural also we are able to connect it. But urban transportation is having huge uh, gaps. So my previous uh, panelist has given a very detailed account of it. So one example I am citing, around 10% of the buses are sharing 32% of the population in the urban segment. So there is a huge gap. And the state transport undertakings directly operated by the state government departments, well, very, very experienced transport undertakings are there in India. But uh, the STUs are focusing mainly on the long distance because the urban transportation is uh, incurring huge losses because of the traffic jams the coverage of the vehicle per day is very less and added to that the personal cost is also huge high so that is why the stus are not bothered to increase the urban transportation sector so that is why the personal transport mode is increasing and causing so many problems like pollution traffic jams and late, uh, um, uh, running late, et cetera, et cetera. So next, ma'am. Next slide, please. Yeah, they, this uh, just, uh, we, we know why uh, the buses are uh, encouraged uh, here means it is uh, meant for the short distance and very flexible. It can go anywhere to anywhere. And the per km cost is very less. And uh, the network is also very flexible. When the city grows, and as per the city growth and the network can be replanned also. So, and uh, bus transport is a space efficient transport, we know. So 10 times it carries uh, the load when compared to the car, just occupying two and a half percent of the space on the roads. Next week. Yeah, just uh, to understand how the structure is evolved for providing the public transport in India, the central government is providing for union uh, territories and the main responsibility lies on the state government only. The state governments are providing the public transport through direct transport department in some states and in 90% of the case, it is only through state transport undertakings and the municipalities and the uh, special purpose vehicles are also slightly 
uh, uh, in a meager manner, they are also providing the public transport. These are the concerned acts. Why I have put up is the acts are so rigid and uh, it is definitely uh, working against the increase of the productivity and a rigid union uh, system is also there. That is also preventing STUs to progress much. Next. Yeah, so STUs and municipal corporations and uh, SPVs put together around 61 institutions are there in India. So providing around 1,57,000 buses and the major uh, uh, percentage is for the long distance only. Only 24,000 buses are earmarked for the uh, uh, urban segment. In, the, in that, uh, only 12 to 13,000 are uh, the private uh, public participation vehicles. And uh, another important segment is provided by Bus and Car Operators Confederation of India. They are providing around 15 lakh buses, but all the buses are long distance, interstate, and uh, tourism, uh, then uh, schools, uh, and uh, factories, etc., etc. So, one name is buses per lakh of population. All buses put together in India, it is 114 per lakh of population. But whereas in China it is 180, USA 270, Mexico 280, and Brazil 450. So through this slide, what I would like to just uh, tell is the gap, overall gap is also huge, not only in urban segment. Next, ma'am. Next slide, please. Yeah, so sensing the urgency, the government, India, government of India has brought out national urban transport uh, uh, policy during 2016 and uh, after that some sort of funding uh, has started uh, to um, share to the STUs for providing very good uh, public transportation in urban sector. So for example through JNNRM, Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission around 23 bus, uh, 23,000 buses are provided and first time in India the air suspension and AC low floor buses are provided through this scheme. Earlier, you used to operate a chassis that can be built a, um, a lorry and also the bus. There are no comfort levels. First time, comfort levels are given through this scheme. Of course, BRTS also it is not encouraging. So it is in between road transport and metro. So like metro, it gives a faster service. But uh, like a road transport, it is a, a very low cost uh, uh, product. But due to the condition, exclusive uh, BRTS roads are not able to carve out in India. So that's why BRTC is not increasing. Of course, Metro 2017, Metro has come and Metro is helping a lot. And around 18 cities, uh, Metro is already implemented. And Metro serves only unidirectional flow. And buses, whereas buses, it can go anywhere to anywhere. And as my uh, previous panelist has already told about the introduction of the electrical vehicles, Department of Heavy Industries uh, has already uh, subsidizing for procurement of the uh, electrical buses um, uh, around 465 under FAME scheme. Uh, around 465 buses are already uh, given and uh, FAME 2 scheme is also there. But due to the COVID uh, issues, it is getting delayed. Next, next minute. Yeah, it is one important thing, a study, important study I would like to tell. Uh, World Bank and uh, uh, International Transport Forum and World Research Institute during the year 2011 together brought out an interesting uh, 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 report. So, they have studied 108 uh, Indian cities whose population is more than 5 lakh. So segregated into four segments, Tier 1 and Tier 2 and Tier 3 and Tier 4. So Tier 1 cities are more than uh, 80 lakh uh, population and Tier 2 cities are around 40 to 80 lakh population and Tier 4 cities are around 10 lakh to 40 lakh and uh, uh, tier, uh, tier 3 cities and tier, tier 4 cities are uh, uh, 5 lakh to 10 lakh. So there is a norm they have fixed. For the tire, four, tire 1 cities, the norm is around 60 buses per lakh population. Uh, we have to ensure it. And for a tire 2 cities, 
around 50 buses for lack of population and 40 buses for tier 3 and uh, 30 buses for tier 4 tier 3 and tier 4 cities are uh, ter terribly neglected only two wheeler and cars are increasing and uh, if there is no public transportation future the problems may be many so uh, the projections also the population would double from 198 million to 412 million uh, from 2010 to 2015 so it indicates that there is an urgent need gradually we have to improve the urban transportation uh, urban bus transportation so uh, they also brought out that two wheeler will increase from 50 to 231 for 1000 uh, population and cars will increase from 183 to 352 uh, for 1000 population uh, the irony is the personal mode share will increase 30 to 48 percent so uh, already there is no space on the road but uh, due to uh, due to the uh, increase of the personal mode and uh, the worst will further increase and walking and cycling in the developed uh, cities abroad they are given uh, more uh, importance for the uh, walking and cycling but in our case the walking and cycling is uh, uh, segment is diminishing from 20 38 percent to 21 percent of course the co2 and brt is not that much encouraging next man next slide so that is why so a ministry of road transport and the highways as i already told I, I entered into an agreement with the world bank and transport for london i am one of the uh, 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 group members we have traveled 14 months uh, across india and some abroad also and studied very minutely so for easy purpose we have segregated our study into four segments component one is planning and public transportation strategy and the financing and leasing models is the component two and intelligent transport systems component three and capacity and competence enhancement because there is there are uh, low skill levels available in STOs especially in contracting system and ITS front so that is also one of the uh, very important uh, uh, learnings we made so intelligent transport system many of the organizations uh, STOs have not implemented except uh, uh, like uh, APS RPC and uh, BMTC uh, Karnataka, uh, I think BEST and GSRTC, uh, etc. But uh, APS RTC has implemented all the modules full fledged. There is a slide I am going to uh, tell also. Next, ma'am. Next slide. See, the main uh, observations what we have uh, found is among the STUs. There are so many best practices. So earnings are more and expenditure is very less. The bus staff ratio is also very less. Very innovatively, some organizations are going and some issues are uh, lagging behind. So when the best practices are shared among the other issues, uh, there would be a good scope for increasing the earnings and a reduction of the expenditure. That is one uh, finding we made. And uh, higher buses are performing better. So even though, the percentage of the higher buses in India uh, is very meager, except the APSRTC. APSRTC is operating around 24% of the higher buses. The advantage is though there is no capital investment required and there is no maintenance required, and around 36% to 40% reduction is there in the expenditure uh, through the higher buses. Around 2 to 3% occupancy ratio is also increased because of the efficiency of the higher buses. So that one uh, uh, thing we made, uh, and uh, low viability gap funding, see, across the world. So across the world, the urban transportation is a loss-making proposition. So it is no uh, better in uh, India also. But there, the, some uh, sort of funding is uh, given for the sustainable urban transportation. But in India, except uh, sparingly through budget, some governments are giving some fund. So that's why the long range planning is affecting and the sustainability of the urban operations and uh, uh, total operations is also not going as planned. So because of the huge losses, already the students are suffering like anything. Next now. Next. So we have examined the contracting models available in India. So 
gross contract model and a net contract model. And Niti Aayog has recently given a very good uh, uh, contracting model. So around seven to eight uh, contracting models along with the London model also we have studied. But uh, there are some lacunas in our contract system we found. Existing contracts are route based. See, the SCUs and uh, other uh, transporters, they are operating, concentrating more on the mileage. How many kilometers they are running is the criteria. But uh, how effectively, how the passenger uh, uh, needs are met, met is uh, given a, a backseat. So that is one of the observations we made. And uh, the, uh, the penalties are also huge. And the payment is also uh, not as per the agreement conditions. So that's why the um, urban transportation by the private operators are not encouraging in India. So one of the recommendations is how to invite the uh, um, um, private operators because private investment has to come. I already told that 36 to 40% already uh, the, there is an advantage for introducing a higher bus. The efficiencies will also come. So that's why we are uh, remodeled uh, the agreement uh, uh, of the higher agreement also. Next, ma'am. Next slide. Of course, we are recommended uh, uh, gross contract, uh, uh, gross cost contract model, but with quality incentives. It is working very well in London. London is operating around 9,500 buses with uh, only less than 400 their own staff. All the buses are hired basis only. So the operations are given to, uh, the responsibility is given to the higher operators only. Whereas in India, so bus procurement, and bus operation and the monitoring, everything is done by the STUs only. So there uh, it is a very successful model. The network planning is done in such a way that from anywhere to the bus stop, if you can walk 400 meters, you will find a bus stop from office, from home, from recreation, from whatever it may be. So here the network planning is uh, not scientifically done because of uh, the absence of the ITS system. So that's why uh, we have recommended for a national ITS framework so that uh, a smaller organizations can also land into the structure and they can have the tracking of the buses and the um, uh, estimated uh, um, arrival of the timings, etc. So if uh, tracking is there and the estimated arrival times are available, the passenger will definitely feel convenience and they will plan their trip uh, as per the uh, um, uh, location of the bus. Uh, th that is uh, purely um, uh, majority of the organizations it is uh, uh, absenting. Tree and uh, recommend a treat operated as a business uh, partners and uh, timely trustworthy payments were recommended through ESCO account. The London is paying the um, uh, amount as per the schedule date. That also we have recommended here. Next, ma'am. Of course, the ITS, this is a general slide. So uh, customer focus has to be given. In the new contract system, customer segmentation, customer focus, customer needs are how to be adequately met. So one of the uh, thing what we found is uh, in London, standardized customer service they are conducting through so many means. And the customer focus business model they are preparing. Customer is the centric, center of the business. And they, they, their, uh, the open data policy is there. The total performance is uh, given access for the public. And the uh, third parties are giving so many apps and so many innovative things without charging anything they are doing. And we have also recommended uh, for this. And the centralized scheduling. Here in India, a depot is a basic operating unit. The depot manager, he is adding the depot. He will plan the schedules. And uh, when it goes on the road, there is another bus of another depot and uh, there is a clash. So if uh, proper ITS support is there, we can have a centralized scheduling. So these problems, the redundancy problems, the clash problems, the delayed problems, everything can be um, uh, set right. And uh, the 100% the, the payment of uh, through ITS also recommended because the present uh, um, uh, higher vehicle system, uh, the payments are not done 
as per the due date and uh, the kilometers are ca uh, taken away for calculating the higher bills unilaterally. That is the main uh, um, uh, grievance uh, the BOCI, Bus and Car Operators Confederation of India. Uh, when we conducted the workshops, they have told uh, these points. Next, ma'am. Next slide, please. Of course, uh, this uh, slide uh, uh, for APS RTC. APS RTC has implemented all the modules, and they are also going first time in India. The, they are going for ERP, and ERP is also going to complete within a short period of time. If APS RTC implements ERP, that would be a first time in India in public uh, transportation sector. Thank you. Next. Of course, uh, they have already derived some benefits also through the ITS and the proper scheduling. Uh, operational efficiency has increased by 5% and increase of uh, commuter satisfaction. So this is very important so because uh, there is no loyalty. For commuter, there is no loyalty. He can go uh, by any means. So 24% increase in the loyalty has increased and decreased travel time. This is one. If the travel time decreases, people will love to uh, travel by uh, transport uh, buses. And uh, decreased, decreased accident rate also. Next, please. Next, ma'am. Next, ma'am. Next slide, please. Of course, so uh, to sum up the four national workshops we have conducted, one international study visit, uh, we have taken the people there, and one national study also we have conducted. Next, Next slide. Yeah, this is uh, the summary of uh, our findings. As my previous panelist has already told the demand. So here the demand in the developed uh, uh, cities, 100 to 200, minimum 100 to 200 buses per lack of population is there, roughly. So in our India, it is only less than 18 buses are there uh, in the urban segment per lack of population. So we have calculated at least 50 buses uh, per lack of population, the requirement would come to around 1,80,000, 1,50,000 to 1,80,000 buses. Down the line from 8 to 10 years, uh, we have to introduce in our urban segment. Otherwise, there is no road space to walk also because Mumbai is already experiencing the same problem and Delhi is also. And uh, every urban city is uh, having this problem. So that's why we are recommending. But uh, with the, the uh, all the buses uh, from here on after, what we are going to introduce is only from private sector. There is an advantage. Efficiency advantage is there. Cost reduction advantage is there. So from, uh, and uh, the robust IT with the support of robust IT support system and uh, the viability gap funding. Of course, I, I am not going to share the total data, but uh, uh, central government is uh, proposing to share uh, some uh, uh, amount for the every operated kilometer uh, for the urban segment for at least for 8 to 10 years for the higher vehicles for a proper uh, payment to ensure a proper payment system uh, uh, and uh, the equal uh, uh, grant shall be given by the state government. Of course, that is in, uh, in the process stage. Uh, um, I, I am not going to. Uh, I am not going to delve further upon this. So these are the some of the findings uh, uh, we are uh, uh, prepared and submitted to the uh, government. And uh, uh, next, next, next uh, slide. Of course, uh, this is already dealt the pre and post COVID. Uh, the post COVID uh, um, uh, woes are more uh, because of the physical distancing norm, etc. So definitely, the STUs are uh, definitely going to suffer a lot. So with this, I conclude. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Singh Sir. Thank you. What to Dr. Sir? Thank you very much uh, uh, for an excellent presentation. I have one question, basically. Yeah. Are you getting any financial assistance or support from what? Bank, or they are only providing the technical support in the public transport advisory mission. But definitely, sir, uh, um, unofficially, I can tell the project cost what we are visualizing is around 75,000 crores. 
funded by the uh, World Bank. In that around 70% goes for the viability gap funding, okay. what I am just uh, told. And 25% it goes for the ITS. So we require robust ITS. All STS require. And the 5% goes for the skill improvement because mm. there are depth of skill improvement, skills are there in the STUs. Mm. So that is under process. Sir. So I cannot tell more than that. But okay. uh, central Fine. government Fine. is seriously thinking on increasing the urban transportation. And in terms of, uh, you know, you mentioned some 1,50,000 additional buses required or something like that. Uh, yeah. Will there be, you know, do, uh, do we have enough capacity to produce more buses, to manufacture more buses? So, uh, definitely, see, once uh, the government support is there through contract system for the coming uh, down the line 8 to 10 years, so these projections are made. If not one and a half lakh, at least 50% uh, of that also, if uh, the buses are uh, can able to come on the road, it will definitely serve the purpose. Mm. Uh, uh, once the, uh, I think uh, the, the bus manufacturing capacities can be built up, sir, there is no problem. And the chassis manufacturers also will the, definitely they'll come forward. But due to this COVID, it may definitely delay for more than six months. That's fine. That's okay. We are uh, talking of a perspective for next 10 years until 2030. Yeah. So I do hope. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, uh, sir. I'll now like to invite uh, uh, another distinguished speaker, Mr. Alok Jain. Mr. Alok Jain is a very well-known international expert in public transport operations and management. Currently, he is the managing director of Transconcerns based in Hong Kong. His specialization is in new technology, artificial intelligence, data analytics and clean fuel technology. With 30 years of experience in the industry, Alok has worked with an array of international consultants and leading transport operators like MPR Corporation Hong Kong and Kowloon Motor Bus Hong Kong. He is a well-known international trainer as well. And we look forward to his presentation addressing the challenge that we are going to have for improving our public transport system and by filling up the gaps that we have in the public transport system. Mr. Jain, please. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, I think my screen is visible and I'm audible. Yes, very much so. Kindly continue. Okay, I will I will just uh, put, put some facts correct before, uh, before I start with the presentation. Uh, one thing which was mentioned that uh, Nowhere in the world bus companies or buses, bus operations are profitable or make money. Uh, I'll just tell you that in Hong Kong, all the bus companies, there are five franchises and all of them, they run net cost model and all of them are profitable. I happen to run one of those for almost four years and uh, we, we actually turned the company around from a loss making company uh, in four year company. It was it comprised the habits and improve the system. And I'm saying this as as a, as somebody who, who drives buses, uh, who uh, has uh, run the operation, carried a lot of people, and handled a lot of uh, bus industry stuff. So my I look at my presentation in that context. I'm going to talk about very simple things uh, and and uh, something that can be done very easily. And that I was very conscious of this fact when I was making the presentation that. We are not going to talk about billion dollar investments. We are not going to talk about, uh, you know, buying thousands of buses or what we can do with what we have is the primary goal at the moment, especially after COVID when we don't have enough uh, finances in cities. So this, uh, with, the, with the COVID, we basically saw a cycle of, you know, flight, fright and fight. So we had, we saw lockdowns, everything just appear, uh, dis everybody disappeared. And then we saw the trains and buses coming back in the cities and then no passengers in, in those. And now a lot of cities around the world are trying to bring people back. There's a huge campaign going on to restore order, restore public transport in the cities. China was quoted a little earlier. And, and just for the record, the China 
is almost 80% of the ridership in China is back on public transport in most of the places which are not uh, which are out of the lockdown stage. So the number of 20-25% was the lockdown stage numbers, uh, and they have been restored uh, now by now. So it's it's in fact in Beijing, uh, April 2020 uh, figures uh, on the on the road traffic was actually higher than April 2019 figures. So we are seeing. Uh, a whole turnaround, and and I have personally experienced uh, SARS in Hong Kong 2003, which was like a trailer of this pandemic. We also went through a three month of a very high um, infection period in Hong Kong, uh, and that disease was even more infectious than than COVID 19. And yet, people are you know city people memories are very short. And, and often if you're running a good system, good public transport operation, people do come back to that. So what we need to do is focus on how to make it good and how to bring people back into, into our public transport system. So some of the things that happened was the scaremongering, a lot of scaremongering, which was non-scientific, which was non-evident-based. Non uh, in UK especially, um, you, you saw the ministers uh, in, in UK, Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, they were all saying, avoid public transport if you can. And this narrative was absolutely wrong. In all the countries where the COVID was contained, public transport never stopped. Tai Taiwan, Seoul, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, all these places, public transport kept running. We took very high degree of precautions. We did a lot of disinfection. And I can tell you the good part here is that with the disinfection, and if you maintain good quality of hygiene, a bus could be cleaner than your home sofa or, or any car for that matter, or your, or your working table in the office, because the, the amount of care that is applied in disinfecting these, these assets is completely disproportionate to what we do at our own homes. So there was absolutely no need to do this scaremongering around the cities. So this scaremongering, what it did, it created a crisis of confidence. What we are seeing everywhere, and when people are being asked on, uh, you know, this is a survey that came out just yesterday uh, from McKinsey, and they basically looked at health, public health perception uh, by people. And you can see public transport rates very poorly here. People think the narrative, and, and this is the narrative here, people think that the public transport is unhygienic, not safe, could be more infectious, which is completely wrong. And, and if you again look at data, uh, all around the world, uh, this is, is not really whole water at all. Public transport actually has been one of the safest way to travel during this whole pandemic period. Of course, COVID is not just the bad side of things. Uh, one of the jokes that was going around was this, that who is leading the digital transformation. So the whole world has been talking about uh, digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation. But we have all been going through circles and ITS is a nice word on a PowerPoint slide, but when it comes to real implementation on ground, uh, and I have seen this firsthand in many Indian cities, uh, they have implemented all the systems, ticked all the boxes, but the utilization and the full, uh, in, uh, what we call the whole, uh, taking out the whole performance and efficiency of this ITS system is not really happening on ground. So. Just putting the system is not going to change the culture in our companies. But what has happened with COVID-19, we were forced We were forced to look into these channels. We were forced to expedite a lot of this digital transformation into our assets. And that was a natural requirement. And obviously, necessity, as we say, is the mother of invention. And so a lot of new tech that was always there, people reconfigured that immediately, put it together, and brought it into cities. There's a picture here which you see of a robot. And this is a disinfection robot that goes into trains in Hong Kong. And as the train goes to the terminal, the robot goes in and disinfects the entire train for the next service. And this is what I'm saying, the level of disinfection that we are doing, sterilization that we are doing, that the number of pathogens uh, on the surfaces of a train or a bus are nearly zero as compared to your uh, your sofa, home sofa, or your home, uh, your, your office table, okay? Also, there was a lot of effort on the technology side, on the mask detection. A lot of countries, a lot of cities implemented compulsory masking, and that technology came very quickly. 
Now, these are very, very cheap, you know, not very expensive technologies, doesn't require years and years of planning. These are literally coming out in, in weeks, uh, if, if not less. Okay. Automation, a lot of automation was always available to us. And I'm not really talking about autonomous bus as such. And that, that is really a bit far off as we know, but a lot of technology that is used on an autonomous bus can be utilized today in auto, or what we call assisted driving or semi-autonomous driving, uh, including in our depots. So a lot of those technologies are available and can be utilized without much cost. And the return on investments are just amazing here. And, and again, this requires careful planning, careful configuration. It will have an impact on workflow processes. It will have impact on your um, uh, skill sets that are required within, within our organizations. But these are all part of preparing for the future. We don't really need very dis big disruptions uh, in those things. Robotics. Uh, a lot of these robots are also available. We are already using a lot of bots uh, in our phones, uh, you know, the series and Alexas and, and, and uh, Google and everybody, you know, whenever we talk to a machine, these are all in a way are bots. But a but lot of these bots and drones are already available uh, in a very commercial manner, which can be deployed very easily in maintenance systems, in creating safety, better safety around, around our uh, operations, as well as better uh, engineering, monitoring and maintenance. The cities, I'll move to the customer side. We have to ask a question, why do our cities look like this? Why, you know, we have so many cars on the road. Why we have so many two wheelers on the road? Why are these guys are not in our air conditioned buses? And that answer is, is there because you and I, uh, we don't go into these buses. And the reason for that is these buses do not meet our expectations. So customers we are not really serving the customer and one something that i always mention not just in india but in many other countries many other cities around the world that we run buses for the convenience of operators we don't run buses for the convenience of customers what we need to do is change it, this mindset we have always treated our passengers as a captive rider they don't have a choice these guys will come anyway, no matter what, no matter what we do, even if the bus is overloaded, even if bus is dirty, even if bus is broken, even if bus is slow, these people don't have a choice but to come to our buses. And that mindset need to change. People do have choice in today's world. Uh, demand responsive transit and all those set, said and done, a good bus service always attracts more people than any other service. And there are a lot of examples I can quote again, if you look at your uh, Asian neighbors uh, of India, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, um, Taiwan, China, fixed route bus services are doing wonders. They carry most of the people in the city. Other thing that we have to invest a lot is in our own people. Uh, in India, you see the, a, a job of a bus driver is not a coveted one. A uh, job of a bus conductor is not a coveted one. And the moment they have a better opportunity, they move on, they, they move and they, they take another uh, employment. Average age in some of the STUs of a bus driver is, is 50, reaching 50 years old. And that is really not sustainable. What is happening? Why are we not able to attract good talent into, into the industry? We need to create an industry of people. We need to train them. We need to make these people take pride in their, in, in their work. And one of the things that we can that we can that can be transformational in countries like India is inclusion of women into the workforce, and and that also goes a long way towards gender gender sensitization in for customers. We know how how uh, you know female passengers feel on on the buses in in Indian cities, and that has to improve if we want to sustain the ridership. They are fifty percent of the population; they can't be ignored, and if we bring them on board, this will change the whole marketplace, whole customer delivery that we are doing at the moment. And it will be very inclusive. And I, I always, when I was doing the bus operation, used to ask this fact, why does a duty of a driver need to be eight hours? Why can't it be six hours? 90, more than 90% of the women actually leave the workforce to raise a child, to raise up, to take care of a family. And after some time, 
when the when their kids grow up the women are available but there is no work that is available for these women if we create our work requirements in such a way which are more friendly to this segment of the population 50% of the population we can transform uh, the whole industry you know from inside out dubai is a classic example they launched uh, starting july they had female bus drivers in 2017 when i went to dubai and i was doing some training work with rta i raised this point with them and i said why don't you have female drivers and it was an uh, you know at that time uh, was a taboo there and but then obviously i, I must congratulate them they they went through the process they they went through the whole exercise and finally uh, in 2020 they have uh, they have female bus drivers so they have they have inducted three female bus drivers and they are doing quite well and and hopefully they will have more female bus drivers in the workforce obviously we need to when we do that we need to reconfigure our depots we need to reconfigure our workspaces we need to make certain changes to accommodate the need for for gender specific needs uh, but yes it's not impossible it has been done in many places and it can very easily be done in in indian environment other thing is compete or collaborate uh, most of the indian cities we don't see much of the integration uh, i was in chennai uh, last year so every bus is using a different ticketing system metros are using a different ticketing system intercity services have different ticketing system there is no common ticketing there is no institutional integration they are all siloed there are no physical integrations uh, in terms of interchange facilities there is no single platform where you can find all the information this is all very disaggregated and people have this siloed mentality where they are building empires and and they are not not collaborating with each other post covid i think we don't have a choice we don't have a choice as a industry to think or or look at our fellow operators as competitors we need to look at them as collaborators we need to come on the simple common platform we should be fighting for the customers and to the customer it really doesn't matter whether it's operator a or operator b or operator c all they want is a good service to go from point a to point b and that can only be done if we really create a integrated offering uh, to our customers and, and a lot of people talk about mass and and you know smart city is a buzzword in india in, uh, at the moment so if you convert your smart city into your smart customer centricity this is exactly what mass actually does mobility as a service does bring everything on one platform india is a technological powerhouse it is actually the back office of the whole world it is very easy to implement all this require again if this doesn't require a whole lot of infrastructure whole lot of money but it certainly requires changing mindsets open data data governance open standards uh, open data sh uh, and um, sharing platforms and of course uh, some regulation and laws around it so that they can be aggregated and presented to the customer as a whole suite of choice when you go to a restaurant you have the full menu and you choose the dishes you want to eat you nobody eats just nobody goes to a restaurant that only serves one dish and that's exactly what we need to create in our cities when it comes to mobility give them a give our people a platform give our customers citizens a platform where they can choose what they want to do based on their preferences at that particular point of time artificial intelligence it sounds a very big word uh, but it is coming now in it becoming very pervasive i was reading a report that uh, whether we like it or not by 2025 almost 95% of the customer service would be ai assisted or ai driven and that's a big number to look at uh, similarly if you look at your operations uh, you look at engineering safety security there are whole range of applications and again referring to indian bus operations most of the bus companies in india they already have basic infrastructure they already have a lot of data in place but nobody is using that data for example when we talk about scheduling the buses even depot based scheduling how many bus operators in india actually have a scheduling optimization software very little i don't know i mean i don't know of any who does and if you don't apply those scheduling optimization software we are coming to this very simple what we call one man one bus kind of a operation which is highly inefficient 
if we look at whole all of our asset, people as an asset, buses as an asset, our depots, terminals, and stops as assets, and if we put them into one one combined pot, and if we start to optimize within that, we can absolutely transform. And I always say this, that the need here is not to just use that those multipliers and buy more buses. What we need to find out is every time the bus is standing there and there is a customer standing there and the bus is not running, you need to figure out how you can make that bus run within using, exist, using your existing resources to carry that passenger. Every single minute that the bus is not, not doing the revenue service is a wastage of that, that asset. And that optimization can only be done when you apply these advanced scheduling and rostering uh, uh, softwares or, or optimization tools. Those things need to be put in place. And immediately, if you are currently serving the demand that with 100 buses, you, if you do those tools, you can enhance its capacity by 20, 30 percent by using using these optimization tools. And those these things are already there. Uh, and but somehow not being applied. So we need to boost the capacity. We need to improve the utilization of the assets. Buying EV electric buses are great, but electric buses will follow their total cost of operation. Will we will be suffering from the same problem because if we don't optimize the fundamentals or hygiene issues in our bus operation, they are not going to do wonder by itself. Because, but we need to change our practices how we operate our bus services right now. In the end, if we keep customers in center, we talked a lot about that. And if we keep our staff in center, and, and if we create a better workplace, better operations, just using our existing resources, we can actually offer a lot of delightful experience to our customers. We know this, this pandemic is not going to just disappear overnight. This is going to possibly stay with us for a while. And within that, we need to boost that confidence among our um, customers, among our users and citizens, and bring this narrative very clearly that this is a safe mode to travel. This is the best way to travel. Uh, and this is good for not just them, it's good for the city, and it's good for environment. It's good, it just, you know, it goes in good in so many ends. And what we need to do is educate our citizens and customers so that they use public transport services and create better cities in India. With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jan, for a very excellent presentation. In fact, there are so many questions, but there is no time. We will be sending all those questions to you while we share also your presentation to all the participants. And I so, think we will... We so will just for the reference, uh, Dr. Singh, uh, I have my contact details in this presentation. Uh, feel free to connect with me if you want uh, to drop a question in other channels. Feel yeah. free to do so. I will try to answer them as much as I can. Oh, certainly, yes. There are obviously several questions which are there. I think we, we will certainly remember that good bus service always attracts people and we do need optimization tools to make the best use of the existing fleet that we have so that we are able to meet the demand. Uh, our last speaker basically is Professor Geetam Tiwari. Professor Geetam Tiwari is the Ministry of Urban Development Chair Professor for Transport Planning at the Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Delhi. She did her PhD in Transport Planning and Policy from the University of Illinois, Chicago. She was the guest professor for Sustainable Urban Transport at the Chalmers University of Technology, Sweden from 2007 to 2010. And she was conferred a degree of Doctor of Technology honoris causa in 2012 by Chalmers University. She has been working in the area of traffic and transport planning and traffic safety, focusing on pedestrians, bicycles, and bus systems. She has been working in India also with several cities, state governments, and national government on public transport and road safety projects. I welcome her presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for that introduction. And uh, it's wonderful to be here amongst these uh, very uh, knowledgeable experts and um, panelists. So, in my brief presentation now, this is the last one. So. 
I can, I guess, put together a whole lot of issues which have been discussed so far. Uh, I'm going to focus on specific issues uh, relevant to India. And first thing I want to start with is making a distinction between need for bus systems versus demand. And there is a very uh, subtle difference between the two. Uh, as we know, all our uh, numbers for India, uh, people, uh, uh, socioeconomic characteristics, type of urbanization. Uh, we have all these numbers and earlier panelists have discussed also. There is a need for public transport and especially bus-based public transport because of at least these four bullet points which are here, if not more. We do have low vehicle ownership of cars. Of course, there is a challenge coming from high ownership of motorized two-wheelers. Uh, we do have increasing dependence on non-agricultural activities, even in rural areas. Number of people employed purely in rural uh, agricultural um, uh, occupation is becoming less and less. And in rural areas also, people need to access education and health facilities. Uh, so they definitely need uh, road-based public transport systems. Uh, then in large urban areas, say let's say population above 1 million, there is spatial expansion. So uh, trips are, um, trip lengths are increasing. And there is increasing distances between uh, residents and work. And the, this is especially uh, very uh, important for poor people who do not have um, uh, personal vehicle ownership. As far as our small cities are concerned, even in small cities, commute to nearby other towns or work is becoming quite common because not all work is uh, available within the city. So given these, at least these four conditions, and there could be many more conditions also, there is a law, there is a huge need for uh, road-based public transport. How are we doing as far as this is concerned? So I'm sharing with you census data of 2011 and some recent small surveys in some cities have shown that the numbers have not changed dramatically from this. So at a national level, this is uh, urban districts and this is commute to work. Of course, the largest number of people commuting are walking and bicycling. And we know that the environment is very hostile and we have not done any special uh, provisions for these two. So clearly these are captive users. In this, we also have 20% users trips are by buses, which is same as motorized two wheelers. And in fact, what you notice for buses is that buses are being used more by women as compared to men. And this is quite reverse for motorized two wheelers. So bus transport, even in our given condition, which is hostile, we have overcrowded buses, we do not have reliable service, and we do not have good technology buses. But because of our captive ridership, uh, they continue to play a very important role. Now, what is demand? And I think here we have to clearly understand, and demand I am really clubbing with market for buses. And we have to understand the difference between state versus private ownership. If a motorized two-wheeler ownership is increasing, it is completely private ownership. And there are a lot of advertisements. It is very convenient, economical, flexible, and uh, uh, even uh, capital investment in motorized two-wheeler required is very low. But when, and same thing, to some extent goes for cars also, but that is only affordable by uh, high income people. So as far as buses are concerned, public transport, state has to play a very important role. And uh, some of the earlier presentations have looked into the history of bus systems also. We know that formal systems, mostly state run, was introduced in India in around mid 1950s. And uh, very soon after that, some cities started uh, operating uh, state-run bus systems in Delhi and Mumbai, etc. But by 1980s, we already have this number 
that some states withdraw complete state support to uh, bus systems. And we do have today states, uh, uh, um, Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, and some other states where it is completely in the private sector. So what has really happened is that bus uh, need is there, but who is going to provide buses? Who is going to buy buses? In this state has to play a very important role. And why state is not able to do? Where is the revenue stream for states or in fact, not just states, even for cities? Because many cities are, need urban systems and bus systems. So where is that revenue stream that the municipal corporation of a city can decide to buy buses? There is a big question mark. The bigger, to me, uh, even a bigger concern is we continue to focus our discussion on financial losses. And in 1980s, also mid 1980s, when the state started withdrawing support to uh, STUs, it was because of financial losses. And this discussion has continued up to today. And earlier, uh, it was mentioned that how uh, most uh, STUs are running under financial losses. There are only few in India. Um, Dr. Alok Jain talked about uh, examples from Hong Kong, but let's state in India what is happening. Uh, so even the more efficient run systems are running under financial losses, except uh, with the exception of one or two cases. So if now we really have to question ourselves that are we going to focus on financial losses and run bus as a profit making business? Should that be a prime motivation? So I'll come back to this point. And in fact, the discussion in past few years has been uh, as soon as we start talking about financial losses, then there is whole discussion about privatization of services which happened in 90s. And now we start talking about more PPP models or where there is a combination of state and private ownership. Uh, there is regulatory system, uh, but the buses are owned by private operators, as is the case in Delhi in cluster bus systems. So again, the state is not taking complete responsibility of running this uh, service for the people, but uh, all kinds of models are being explored and we saw glimpses of some of those models uh, in the presentation uh, when uh, Mr. Rao presented this current World Bank study. So let's just look at what else has happened as far as public transport is concerned. And again, the data was shared that today we already have 18 cities uh, with some kind of either running or uh, in implementation state metro systems. So by 2000, even for uh, state funding, Metro becomes the biggest competitor. Because today, most Metro systems either have got funds, they do get funds from state, they get funds from center, and then there are international financing institutions. So in various forms, it's the combination of these three. And what happens to buses? So we see in state budgets and in city budgets, when there is a huge chunk given for public transport, almost 90% is meant for metro systems. And it is not going to bus systems. So systematically, we keep, we have been reducing our commitment and investments to bus systems. And taxes was mentioned earlier also. Uh, there are numerable, repeated taxes on bus systems. Uh, and in fact, bus systems are considered and viewed as a revenue sources for many states because they have to pay road taxes, they are paying taxes on uh, uh, fuel they are consuming. They, uh, so all kinds of, at least five to six different kinds of taxes have been imposed on bus system. In fact, in one of the case study, it was shown that if uh, in Delhi, if DTC is offered the same kind of uh, concessions that Metro system in Delhi is offered, 
then DTC will also break even and it will not be under financial losses. And similar must be the story in many other Indian studies. And of course, with all this history, what has been the consequences, and this has been discussed in detail by other panelists, number of buses per lakh population has declined and continues to decline. Trips on buses continue to decline, even though because of a captive ridership, we continue to have a substantial number of overall trips on buses. But these are not choice users, as was mentioned earlier by panelists. And I think to me, most uh, disappointing thing also has been a complete uh, dis, uh, interest from manufacturers, very little indigenous technology innovation. Whatever happened with low flow buses, also if people know the history of it, specific demand for low floor air conditioned buses was created in Delhi for the first time in 2004. And as a response to that, some buses, uh, Tata's first brought in some low floor buses. Uh, in, uh, and then there was a collaboration with uh, Tata and Marco Polo. And then slowly some other manufacturers got into the uh, whole system of making low floor more comfortable buses. But in last few years, we have seen that uh, since the uh, state commitment, the city commitment for buying buses is not there. So this interest is completely gone. And there is no long-term thinking that if in next 10 years we are going to require, actually it's not just one lakh buses, our estimation is at least three to four lakh different types of buses. How will it become available? If we don't put in the systems now, how, how are we going to afford these buses? So in future also, so this was the current situation. Is the need and demand in future? The answer is definitely yes. We have seen that urban population is going to double in the next 20 years. And most importantly, our most urban areas in India will continue to be mixed land use urban areas and high densities as compared to many other uh, cities. The result of that would be that we will have majority of our trips which are shorter than 10 kilometers. In Delhi today also 70% trips are shorter than 10 kilometers. And these are the trips which are ideally suited for bus systems. And we have introduced metro systems in many uh, cities uh, as we see, saw in earlier presentation. However, metro is an ideal public transport system for trips longer than 10 kilometers. For in Delhi also, the average trip length for metro trip is 16 kilometers. And if majority trips in cities are going to be uh, this medium sized trips or shorter trips, metro ridership and metro uh, will not really suit those long trips. And this is the reason that even today, when Delhi has about 400 kilometers of trips, uh, 400 kilometers of metro, we have around the latest survey showed about 8.5% trips on metro, total trips. So we have to keep it in mind that metro alone cannot meet the need of public transport for all. And there has to be a very strong integration between metro and bus. Partly this was discussed earlier also. Unless that happens, we are not really going to serve uh, all our population and especially the needs of medium uh, distance trips. Future need will also be there because access to pro uh, private vehicles will continue to be low. Uh, even the best of the projections don't show very high ownership of uh, cars. And the challenge from two wheelers, was I mentioned earlier also, will remain. And then we will have, we will continue to have captive users because even if a family has a car or a two wheeler, access to that to women is much low. And we will continue to have substantial population, low income households, uh, living far away from uh, workplaces. Uh, so, th so for that reason, these will be captive users and there will be future need for it. As far as future demand and markets are concerned, 
that is where I think we have to pay a lot of attention and uh, we really have to uh, spend a lot of efforts in creating that demand from the state and only then market uh, will get created and then we will have uh, industry responding to that uh, responding to this uh, more serious definite market so first to my mind comes that first requirement for doing this creating a definite demand and market to which the private sector can respond more uh, easily is uh, with much less uncertainty is that bus systems have to be declared as essential service in all cities. And we have to make it very clear that it is not, uh, the main motivation cannot be to run as a profit making business. Uh, yes, of course, uh, it doesn't have to make losses all the time bus systems can be organized and we saw some discussion earlier uh, various aspects of running a bus systems can be organized in such a way that profits uh, are that uh, losses can be minimized but only this cannot be our motivation i think the vision for bus systems have to be that we have to just increase affordable systems in all our cities as much as possible and as fast as possible and for this, I think major commitment has to come in all three aspects, which is my next bullet point. It has to be given priority on roads. It doesn't mean that BRTS is being created everywhere, but there are different ways of giving priority on roads, including making access to bus stops safe and convenient, bus stops itself safe and convenient, and location of bus stops so all these details have to be uh, done, keeping bus in mind. Today, we, are, we know that we're planning our roads, keeping uh, ro um, cars in mind. And uh, then we are worried about congestion on the roads. So I think there's a conflict in our vision itself. It, buses have to be given priority in operations, in traffic operations. And there are all kinds of systems which are possible, which was discussed earlier. And then buses also have to be given priority in financing by the state and not just state, but then we can come up with some more innovative financing model involving uh, some lending institutions. What is required is really that states have to prepare a long-term plan. It's not about meeting COVID needs or in next two years, what's going to happen. But as Dr. Singh also mentioned, that we are really looking at 2030. And uh, so for 2030, 2040, we have to start planning now what, what is required tomorrow, what is required two years from now, what is possible five years from now. And this kind of roadmap has to be prepared in terms of what riderships we are targeting, what kind of buses we are targeting, number of buses, and only then manufacturers and manufacturing industry can respond to it because industry needs time to uh, invest and get ready for supplying if we need four lakh -like buses in uh, 10 years from now it has to start the process now so we have to prepare we have to really work on this long-term roadmap and not i think today we are most of the time bogged down with uh, just firefighting current situation. One STU is not making financial office, uh, financial uh, um, profits, so close it or start looking at completely uh, private um, uh, participation and private sector models. So important thing is to keep long-term issues in mind, otherwise we are not going to uh, achieve our targets. I think also financial Packaging with Metro is also very important because we have seen Metro systems. In fact, most of the world, they don't make profits. Huge investments are required. Government of India has committed to it. They are doing it. And uh, none of the Metro systems which are running in India are making operational profits. So if this is the case, why are we always looking for operational profits from buses? Why don't we look 
public bus based and metro systems as an integrated public transport. And then we start looking at what kind of financial packaging is possible. If uh, metro systems are able to attract a lot of um, multilateral financing because uh, they are willing to do capital expenditure. Perhaps for bus systems also, we can separate out the capital expenditure and operational, uh, from operational uh, budgets which are required. And then so basically it needs a more innovative financial packaging with metro systems so that we end up having a more integrated system. And Government of India has come out with Metro Act, which is really helped spreading of metro systems in India. I think this is not really doing enough uh, for public transport in the country. We will have to come up with Public Transport Act. And uh, that Public Transport Act has to be, has to declare public transport as an essential service, essential infrastructure with a line budget and then we have to see how we start uh, have a we start having a very serious integration of uh, rail based and road based public transport system because uh, the numbers all analysis i'm not sharing all the detailed analysis here but all analysis shows that unless this integration is there uh, we really are not solving the problem of our urban commuters. In fact, not just urban, but uh, other commuters also. Uh, well, in the previous slide, I didn't, uh, I had written about, uh, in the title, I put in SDG 11.2. As most of you know, SDG 11.2 is providing quality public transport to majority of the uh, uh, commuters. And uh, there are no fixed benchmarks for it, but the whole target is by 2030, if we can have more and more people uh, within accessible distance of quality public transport. So clearly this SDG 11.2 target cannot be met unless we start focusing on road-based public transport. And that's why in the previous slide I was uh, focusing and I was uh, stressing on integration of metro and buses. So as uh, cities expand, yes, the trip lengths start becoming longer, but those are only few trips, but they are important trips. For that, we need metro system, but unless it is integrated with bus system, we are not solving the problem. Okay, so for this future uh, requirements, what are the challenges and opportunities? Uh, competition from two-wheeler is a very serious competition in India because uh, this has implication for uh, how we are going to, uh, what fair policies we are going to have for buses. We already have numbers at the moment bus fares are increased, we lose ridership. Uh, and in fact, we have some opposite good practices also. I would consider good practices from India. For example, in Delhi, government has made uh, bus services free for women. And we haven't seen increase in number of women using buses. So we have to look at some very serious uh, uh, fair policies, not focusing so much on financial losses, but focusing on providing reliable service to majority of the people. And we know that reliability of bus services cannot be ensured unless we start reserving uh, lanes for buses. As long as it goes in mixed traffic, we cannot have very reliable services. And automation and other aspects have already been covered by other um, panelists. And uh, fear, I mean, some people have talked about also in this current pandemic situation, and uh, the, the McKinsey um, uh, uh, the survey that was uh, shared earlier by Dr. Alok Jain also shared, showed that how people are fearful of this. However, all previous pandemics have shown that within six months, the ridership and the number of trips is back to uh, pre-pandemic situation and sometimes more 
which is what was shared by Dr. Alok Jain also. So I think this is a short-lived fear and in any case, the requirement is to increase number of buses. I think my second bullet is the major, major concern because uh, even today I find that decision makers, planners, and many, some of the experts are not willing to prioritize buses on the road and other traffic operations. And because we continue to look at short term gains from constructing more roads for cars and uh, solving in quote unquote, uh, car congestion problem. So if we continue to because be intolerant of car congestion, we, in my view, we are not going to solve. We cannot prioritize buses. So we have to find different ways how to make it uh, more, uh, how to convince our decision makers and planners and experts that if the future, in future, uh, bus transport is playing such an important role and continue to be very important, we will have to tolerate, there will have to be priority on the road. Not all modes are equal. I think some opportunities we already have, and we have shared with you numbers that pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure, uh, bicycles, uh, ridership is quite high in India. But if we are able to provide dedicated and better infrastructure for these two modes, in fact, this, it, this measure itself will help reduce crowding in the buses and maybe a requirement for very large fleets in, in the short term. And we also, I also consider this as an opportunity that most Indian cities are uh, mixed land use, uh, dense densities are higher and resulting in uh, majority trips below 10 kilometers. So we have a huge opportunity to actually capture all these trips to a reliable bus service. And uh, in rural areas also, buses will continue to play a very important role. So uh, this would be very, very important. And I think keeping these few things in mind, we will, I think most important to me is really uh, state becoming more responsive and uh, taking a full responsibility of ensuring that by 2030, we meet the target, uh, SDG target 11.2. So over to you, Dr. Singh. Thank you so much. I think uh, we have overshot our time in a very big way. There are so many interesting points. There are not a lot of issues which can really be discussed. You mentioned about rural areas, depending on buses for access to health, for health and education. But I would say that rural urban connectivity is a very important area also from the economy's point of view. Yeah, yeah. Particularly. Actually, I, yeah, yeah. I did say um, for uh, employment also. Yeah, because there is, there is there's a lot that as a matter of fact needs to be done to improve the economy by improving the rural urban connectivity. Absolutely, yeah. yes. So there are obviously a lot of questions which are there. Perhaps I think we have already overshot the time, uh, but I think uh, we will be very happy if you can kindly respond to those questions as we share them with you. Uh, Certainly. You know, basically, because uh, they become really very, very important. One of the issue which you have raised particularly, which I would like to also agree fully is replacing the metro act with the public transport act which is which should be much more comprehensive you know right. basically because actually that will take care of not just the cities but also i would say that the regions per se mm. the regions which really connect with each other particularly again i come back to the issue of rural urban connectivity which i think it should really take care of that so with that note i would like to thank uh, all the panelists in a very big way and all the participants who joined us today uh, for this uh, webinar. We, we will be making available all these, uh, uh, you know, all, all these presentations 
which will be there on Busworld's website. And we will also be collating the replies to all the questions from all our panelists, which also should become available by early next week on our website. I also would like to make this announcement that our next webinar is going to be scheduled on 22nd, 2nd of, 22nd of October. In fact, uh, 22nd of October, when we have that webinar, uh, the theme is going to be scaling public bus transport with an outlook for 2030. Part of it is touched by Gitamji in this very webinar itself, but I think, you know, we would like to have a very comprehensive kind of uh, view how, as a matter of fact, we can really scale up the public bus transport because by then, India, as a matter of fact, with a given scenario, will have 600 million people living in our cities. Yeah. There is a bigger problem, not just for type uh, tier one and tier two cities, but also for tier three and tier four cities, you know, and therefore we like to have a very comprehensive view. With that note, I like to conclude this webinar. Thank you so much for all of you, for all that Thank wonderful you. presentation that you have given me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.